As spring transitions into summer, the angling pressure on popular streams begins to die down. It's during this transition period that the slate drake emergence begins. The beginning of the slate drake hatch marks the end of the spring hatch season. While these insects rarely provide the blanket hatches that make sulfurs and blue winged olives so famous, the slate drake hatch can still bring a lot of trout to the net. And in addition, because of their hatching behavior and large size, big trout become ever watchful for them. So it's the middle of June right now, and we are kind of at the end of the spring hatch season here. We're transitioning into summer. But the good dry fly fishing isn't over just yet because we're at the beginning of the slight drake hatch, which is one of the longest lasting mayfly hatches here in Pennsylvania and throughout the east and Midwest. So the slate drake is what we really refer to it in our area, but it goes by a lot of different names. The Isonychia, the Iso mahogany drake, the Ludwig coachman, and several other names that I had found doing some research. So the slate drake hatches over a course of about five months, through the middle of June all the way through the middle of October. So it's one of the longest lasting mayfly hatches in the area. And not only does it behave a little bit differently in that regard, but it also has a very unique appearance. And we're gonna explore a lot of the behavior and the appearance and how that relates to trout fishing throughout the rest of the video. So be sure to stay tuned to the very end because there's gonna be a lot of great information. So mayfly nymphs are divided into four categories. Crawlers, burrowers, clingers, and swimmers. And the isonymph is most certainly a swimmer. It's actually one of the most strong in swimming mayflies, which we're gonna see as we collect some nymphs here in a little bit. Uh, that'll become very apparent. So Isonychia nymphs, they prefer a lot of swift moving, gravelly sections of stream, which we're in right now. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk this bank right here, cause they'll swim over to the banks to crawl up on the, on the land to emerge. And in this section of stream, we see so many shucks on the bank. So we're gonna walk the bank section right here, see if we can find any. All right, so as we were walking up the bank here, I found uh, several shucks that where these, where these nymphs crawled up on the rocks and would have emerged, uh, one of which being right here. And as I was saying a little bit earlier in the video, one of these things that makes this mayfly pretty unique is the appearance. So we're gonna do a quick kick sample here and we're gonna show you exactly how some of the live nymphs look and move. Okay, so as you saw, we did a quick kick sampling there using just a homemade seining net that fits right over top of our landing net. And I can't underestimate how valuable this has been for us to be able to fish a new stream and see what the most common size and color of the nymphs are in that local stream. But anyways, as we, uh, we, we got a couple of uh, slate drake nymphs here. As we, as we mentioned earlier, these are a swimming nymph out of the several categories of uh, clingers, crawlers, burrowers, and swimmers. These are uh, definitely swimmers, and they are one of the strongest swimmers in the swimming nymph family. The appearance is very unique compared to a lot of other mayflies. And most of the things that we fish are very suggestive patterns, like hare's ears, waltz worms, uh, pheasant tails, things like that. But one thing with these, because they are so unique looking, we do tie these in a particular slate drake pattern. So to go through some of the distinct features here, you can kind of see very, very closely if you look, 
a white lateral stripe or a white dorsal stripe, I, I should say rather, that goes right over top of the back there that you can include an element like that, some type of yarn or something to go along the dorsal part of your nymph. Also, you'll see like heavily fringed uh, or frilled gills along the abdomen. And what we like to do is to loosely dub our abdomen, wrap it with wire, and then tease that out with a brush. It gives it a really, really accurate uh, depiction of what their abdomens look like here. And another interesting thing about these guys is they'll be primarily filter feeders, just like most mayflies, but unlike any other mayfly that I'm aware of anyways, is they'll actually uh, prey on smaller mayflies and caddisfly larvae, which is pretty unique for mayflies. One of the very unique behaviors of the slate drake is the hatching behavior, where it almost, in some streams, hatches more like a stonefly. Several days prior to the emergence, nymphs are gonna swim in towards shore. And I know behind our camp, we get tons of them in the shallows around mid to late June. It's incredible. Then you see the shucks on the ground. But what they'll do is they'll crawl up on the rocks and they're gonna to start to emerge. This gives them a little bit of an advantage because they're able to dry their wings off before taking off. Sometimes though, they'll fall in the water and then they'll become pretty vulnerable to trout. But that makes the shallows and along the bank a really good place to target. Alternatively, they can also hatch in a second manner, more similar to just a traditional mayfly where it'll just swim towards the surface and they're pretty strong swimmers. They'll swim towards the surface, shed their shuck and just emerge as a normal mayfly would but they do spend a significant time on the water and trout will really key in on these things over the, over the course of the entire hatch, which is a very long one as we had mentioned. And that really gives dry fly fishermen an opportunity to fish dry flies blindly over good holding spots because of this second way that they emerge. Newly hatched duns have more of a silvery, slate-colored sheen to them and turn a little bit darker as they mature. Their wings are a dark dun color and their size ranges from about a 10 to a 12 hook. The slate drake is pretty easy to identify. It's the only fly of importance that has two different colored legs. Their back legs are yellowish green and their front are a brown color that more closely resembles the body. This feature makes them pretty easy to recognize and kind of accounts for that species name, bicolor. Dan and I are working our way up through here and I'm fishing a dry dropper rig on this stretch right here. A slate drake dry with a little dropper underneath. But uh, I actually ended up hooking a fish and I'm, I'm using my five weight, not used to this faster rod as compared to a three. And I broke right off. But that's one of the things with this particular fly is that you can kind of fish blind on good looking water because those fish are going to be so eager to go to that fly for whatever reason they just love slate drakes it could be conditioning due to the long length of the hatch it could be something else but all i can say is it is a really fun fly to just fish blind because i just i love dry fly fishing and i mean i love the slate drake great little fly got a, a nice parachute on here I had a refusal on the dry, so what I did, and I'm still fishing the, uh, I mean, you can see it right there, I'm still fishing the slate drake parachute. And I'll show you a clip of that here in a second. Bringing them in. I had the refusal on the dry, so we figured, you know what? Throw on a nymph underneath it. And here he is, and I'll show you the nymph momentarily. It's a nice fish. There he goes. All right. Let me show you the fly. It's actually my own uh, swimming nymph pattern. Essentially just a, a hair's ear that I tie, but along the back, I have that, that dorsal 
white stripe there, similar to what the naturals have. Nothing fancy, but it gets the job done. So we're just gonna fish this water right here. Uh, Cause it looks like a re some really good holding water. We're gonna fish it through blind. Uh, and that's one thing that I had mentioned earlier. Now the hatch, I just missed the fish. I saw it flash. Uh, that was on the nymph though. Uh, but the thing with the slate drake hatch is because it's such a long lasting hatch, those fish become just naturally conditioned to seeing this thing on the water. And whenever you have that, it just makes, you know, a blind cast uh, that much more effective. That's gonna be a tough hook set. Yeah, absolutely. Nothing. Oh, ooh, fish flashed on the nymph Not as it was way. swimming. As it was like literally picking up. Yep, so that is, that's, I mean, that's a, a key indicator of the slate drake, you know, on the swing there. And I, I was getting some drag and was picking my fly up. Let's see if we can do it again. This is just not easy. That is so slow. Man, that was cool though. I literally saw that fish as it was swinging over. Did he grab it? I don't. He, if he did, it was ever so soft. But it was literally as soon as it started. Oh, zipper! That's a nice fish. That is a nice fish. <laughs> yes. That was awesome. That's a nice fish. Yeah, it is. Oh, and hey, that's another thing with this hatch is for whatever reason it tends to bring some nicer fish to the surface and i don't know if it's just because they're conditioned and they feel like it is more of a safe bet as far as something to take on the surface and it's a big flop that is very odd how that ended up okay wow nice fish good fish there he goes back into that nice little hold right there. But just, he took that Slay Drake, which was just casted literally right under that uh, nice overhanging tree. And I guarantee you right now, I mean, we missed one on a, on a Slay Drake swimming nymph, but if I were to put a green weenie off of this thing, I feel like we'd catch a couple more because we are in that time of year and that's one of my favorite flies. But uh, came on the dry and that is my favorite way to catch them. So a little bit more on the Slate Drake done here. Uh, emerging duns actually take a long time for their wings to dry off. So they'll usually ride the water for a fair amount of time, giving uh, a lot of opportunity for fish to, uh, to take them on the surface. These flies are very vulnerable. They have that, that long body, uh, they're heavy. So like with a lot of the drakes, uh, it makes them really good targets for fish. Uh, alternatively, when they crawl up on the rocks, they were able to really take their time uh, drying off their wings and it makes them a little bit less susceptible to being eaten. But as we said, this hatch occurs over a four, five month period, which really allows fish to key in on them and become less selective then as a result. So the opportunities to fish blind are pretty substantial. As I'm going up here, I actually just saw a fish rise. So we're gonna continue just to fish some of the likely holding places, and then hopefully as we make our way up to where that fish was rising, uh, hook into them. So let's see what we can do here. I'm gonna fish it real quick. Ooh, I just saw a fish flash on it. Yeah, he, he was looking at the dry and then refused. Right, that refusal was right in here. And he took the nymph after getting shut down on the dry. We were able to pick him up on the nymph underneath that dry. Looks like a little rainbow here. 
and let's get them upstream of us and bring them in. I'm trying to keep them out of that hole because I know we saw a fish rising a little bit above it. So I'm going to bring them in here real quick. Here he is. Little Rambo there. And he's going back into that area. So Dan and I are just kind of sitting behind camp right now, waiting on a potential spinner fall, if we're so lucky to get one. Now the spinner falls provide some more concentrated action than the actual emergence does. What the duns are gonna do whenever they leave the stream is they're gonna molt into spinners after a couple of days, and they're gonna fall spent after they drop their eggs above some riffles like we have right now. Now the problem with this time of year is that it's so warm, they're gonna wait until it's a little bit cooler to actually gather above the riffles and drop their eggs. Now that's why earlier in the hatch and later in the hatch, like June and October, provide your best opportunities because of the cooler temperatures. So we'll see what happens tonight and hope for the best. When it comes to fishing the slate drake hatch, I don't really do anything very special whenever it comes to flies. For the nymph, I only tie one specific pattern, and that's the one right here. It's just a, a hare's ear and chocolate brown, but I incorporate two uh, features into it that make it more of a slate drake. The first of which being that heavily fringed tail. I'll tie in three peacock curls uh, to give it that, that look of a slate drake. And secondly, I put in that white dorsal stripe along the back of that hare's ear, and I think that this really acts as a nice trigger point or hot spot for those trout to key in on. Next two are dry flies, the first of which is a parachute. And with the parachute, I, I like it because it sits a little bit more flush to the water. Uh, that's usually my go-to. And then for those extra stubborn trout, this pattern here is a last chance cripple uh, that I tie in slate drake colors, and that seems to work very well for those uh, really tough to catch ones. And then lastly, I have a spinner. And I don't do anything special with the spinner. This is just a size 12 rusty spinner and that seems to get the job done uh, for anything after a certain time of day. So that's what I like to tie for the Slate Drake. Uh, give those patterns a whirl. We might try and do a tying video at some point in the future to show any of those. So thank you guys for watching and sticking around to the very end. Before we wrap things up, we want to make a quick announcement and that is the launching of our new website, BackyardAngling.com. If you enjoyed this video, then be sure to check out the accompanying blog post that we have on the Slate Drake. We're going to leave the link in the video description. Uh, if you found a lot of the facts in the video interesting, the blog will kind of expand on that and provide a little bit more detail if you, uh, if you like what you saw here. Also, we've really enjoyed putting this video series together. We're only uh, the second video into our Backyard Hatches video series. But if you enjoy what you're seeing here, be sure to let us know. Leave a comment, uh, give this video a like, just give us some type of feedback that you like what you're seeing. And if there's any insect in particular, any mayfly or caddisfly or stonefly out there that you would like to see us do a video on, also leave a comment and we'll try to accommodate that and, and do a video and an accompanying blog post on that. So with that in mind, we thank you guys very much for watching and we wish you the best of the hatches.